Did you realize that many of the diseases that we associate with being diseases of the elderly or adult onset actually may have their roots in very, very early life, even life in utero? The concept of developmental origins of health and disease is something that's been around for a while. But in recent years, there's been more and more evidence supports the notion that the fetal environment affects us in ways that sometimes doesn't even show up for decades and decades after we're born. Welcome back, I'm Rich Feldenberg. I'm a pediatric nephrologist and I create videos about science and medicine. The idea that changes in the intrauterine environment may have effects that don't show up for decades and decades later was first really observed back in the years around World War II. In one large population study called the Dutch Famine Cohort, it was observed that individuals who were born to mothers who were subjected to malnutrition due to the conditions in World War II were not only born small, but were at higher risk for developing problems such as type 2 diabetes, obesity, hypertension, cardiac disease, and kidney disease. And that was different than those individuals who had malnutrition after birth. Babies that are born either too small or too big are more likely to eventually develop obesity as adults. So something was going on during the early stages of pregnancy in the fetus that set the programming for these people to then develop a higher likelihood in adult onset disease. And in recent years, the evidence has continued to accumulate that this is in fact the case. And the concept of dohad, doodad? No, not doodad, dohad, or developmental origins of health and disease has become more well developed using both human population studies as well as experimental animal models, mama rats and baby rats. So how could that possibly work that way? Well, it's actually been shown that children with intrauterine growth retardation and have a small birth weight have organ asymmetry. So in utero, the fetus is attempting to divert resources to organs that are essential for fetal survival and divert them away from organs that are less essential. And some of those less essential organs are things like the liver, the lungs, and the kidneys. Now, wait a minute, you might say, well, of course the liver, the lungs, and the kidneys are vital organs, but during fetal life, they're not quite as essential because mom is the baby's liver, lungs, and kidneys. And that is accomplished through the placenta. Oxygenation of fetal tissues is coming from mom's circulation to the fetus through the placenta. And the same is true of liver and kidney function to some degree as well. So babies with intrauterine growth retardation actually have very small livers for, and it's known that liver function is vital for glucose and lipid metabolism. So biochemical changes that occur in a growth restricted liver make them much more susceptible to these other problems we talked about like type 2 diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure, cardiac disease. And researchers found that there is a U-shaped relationship between birth weight and obesity later in life. What this research showed that if babies were less than about 5.5 pounds or more than about 9 pounds, they were more likely to be obese as adults. Mrs. Johnson, congratulations. You just had a bouncing baby boy, but he is a little underweight. So he may be at risk for high blood pressure and diabetes when he's around 50 years old. Hmm. Now it's also thought that glucocorticoid excess is one of the major contributors to some of these changes that are happening in the fetus when there's maternal malnutrition or placental insufficiency. So what do we mean by that? Well, glucocorticoids are the steroid hormones that affect glucose metabolism. And it's been shown that high glucocorticoid activity in the fetus causes a lot of abnormal changes in fetal tissue as far as organ development. And if mom has a lot of stress due to environmental factors or malnutrition, her stress hormones are gonna cause a high glucocorticoid state. Now, normally the fetus is protected to some extent by the high glucocorticoid activity in mom by an enzyme located in the placenta which breaks down the active glucocorticoid to an inactive form. But when there is maternal malnutrition, maternal inflammation, or certain types of infections, that enzyme is downregulated. So some of the active glucocorticoid does pass into the fetus, causing a high glucocorticoid activity level and some of the changes that we are talking about. The organs that are essential for the fetus to survive are things like the heart and the brain. And those organs are often big compared to the liver and the kidney. Well, what about the kidneys? Well, babies that have a small birth weight typically have very small kidneys. And a small kidney usually means that the number of nephrons in that kidney is less than average. And low nephron number has been associated with problems like high blood pressure, early onset of chronic kidney disease, 
and even end-stage renal disease, which requires dialysis or a kidney transplant. So how do the changes of maternal malnutrition and high glucocorticoid activity in the fetus result in some of these changes in the organ systems that can last for many decades down the road? Well, there's more and more evidence that some of these changes are epigenetic in nature. And by that, we mean that the changes are not written in the DNA. So in other words, there's not a mutation in the genes themselves, but epigenetics means that there's a change in the way those genes are activated or repressed. So in normal fetal development and development of the organs, genes have to be turned on and turned off in exactly the right way, in precisely the right sequence for those organs to develop normally. There are certain chemical marks on the DNA and on the histones, which are proteins that help to wrap up the DNA, which makes that gene more likely to be active or repressed. So if those epigenetic marks are altered, then that gene will not be turned on and turned off at the right time. Another hypothesis for how changes in the intrauterine environment result in long-lasting changes in the adult is something called endoplasmic reticulum stress. So the endoplasmic reticulum is an organelle inside the cell which after the proteins in the cell are synthesized, it helps to package those proteins, modify them in the right way so that they can then function for their role inside the cell. Now I also gotta worry about if my endoplasmic reticulum is stressed. My, my. When there are stresses on the cell, such as hypoxia, oxidative stress, poor supply of nutrients and amino acids, then the endoplasmic reticulum becomes stressed and it accumulates these misfolded proteins. And that endoplasmic reticulum stress then causes the cell to activate other programs in its genetic profile, which can result in the cell being dysfunctional or even dying off in a process called apoptosis. So don't let your endoplasmic reticulum get stressed. So for some of us, the diseases that we might be more susceptible to as adults, even elderly adults, may have had their beginnings back when we were fetuses inside our mom's womb. So there's not much that we can do about that now other than to let moms know that they need to get good prenatal care, have good nutrition, take good care of themselves. But understanding these problems better may help us to understand what the root causes for the diseases are. And that then may allow researchers to come up with good therapies that target the underlying causes for these problems, perhaps allowing us to treat these problems in the future better than we're able to treat them today. So thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and we'll see you back here next time. Bye guys. Mrs. Rat, congratulations. You've just given birth to a litter of bouncing baby rats, but they are a little underweight. So they may be at risk for some problems later on. Oh, you guys are so adorable. You're so cute. Hi, baby rats. Hi, baby rats.